In this case, we want to look at the Bohr model of the atom. In class, we saw the bright line spectrum of various atoms when we ran an electrical current through those atoms and saw with the diffraction gradient glasses that you were wearing the various bright line spectrums of the individual atoms. Here we see a picture of one of the bright line spectrums, the bright line spectrum of hydrogen. You see these distinct lines. The Bohr model of the atom begins to explain how this bright line spectrum is created and why it is not a continuous spectrum showing all possible colors. You don't see everything all the way from indigo and violet down to red with all possible colors. You only see very specific bands. This is due to the structure of the atom that Bohr postulated as part of his theory. Now, in Niels Bohr's explanation, Niels Bohr was a Danish scientist, he said that an atom can absorb photons of energy and become excited. So if we think of energy as Planck's constant times frequency, the atom will, the electron will absorb that energy and excite the electron, moving it further away from the nucleus. Remember, the electron is negative, the nucleus is positive. So as it moves further away from the nucleus, it takes more energy. The unexcited state, when they're in the lowest energy level, is known as the ground state. So the photon interacts with one electron and causes it to jump to a higher energy level. Now it can only jump to specific energy levels. It's kind of like the rungs on a ladder. If you step two and a third steps on a ladder, you end up at the second step. You can't take a third of a step in a ladder. Well, similar type idea with an atom. If, you, if the electron is excited, if it has enough energy to get above the second energy level, but not to the third, it'll end up at the second energy level. So it has very discrete amounts that it can jump up. Now, the light that we see is what happens when that energy is back released from the atom, radiated as an electromagnetic uh, wave, a photon that travels through space. Because there are very specific energy levels, there are only specific wavelengths of light that can be given off. And each atom has a different arrangement of electrons, a different arrangement of energy levels. The distance between those energy levels is different and the amount of energy between each one is different, so you see very different bands of energy that are given off by each atom. Now if we look at this picture here, you can kind of see. If we think of the ground state down here. This is our first energy level. This would be second, third, fourth. If an electron jumps from ground state to the first energy level, it will end up here. Now the only possibility for it to go back is to drop back to the ground state. When it drops back to the ground state, it gives off a photon of energy. It has the energy that's the difference between the ground state and the first energy level. If it jumps to the second energy level, we now have more possibilities. It could drop back to the first energy level, giving off the energy that we see here which is less than the energy before, so it'll be more towards the red part of the spectrum, or it could drop all the way back to the ground state. What we find though is when it drops all the way back to the ground state, that's a photon of energy that is not part of the visible spectrum. Because remember, our spectrum goes all the way from radio waves to gamma rays, so there's only certain energy gaps that fit within the visible portion of the spectrum. And here you see very distinct gaps and only the ones that are in purple here are the ones that would be visible for this atom. So you'd see four very distinct bands. And that's going to be true with the Bohr model of any atom. As it absorbs a photon, it jumps to a higher energy level. When it releases back that energy, it only releases the difference between the energy levels of that specific atom. So it only releases specific energies of light and those specific energies are those specific bands that we see in our spectrum, bright line spectrum. And that's why the bright line spectrum can be thought of like a fingerprint for the atom that is unique to each individual atom. Now to really understand the way the electron's working though, we're gonna get into some basics of quantum mechanics. And I wanna finish up today's video with some basics of quantum mechanics, and then we'll get into electron configurations in our next video. So once Niels Bohr had worked out this idea of the energy levels in theory, we need a better explanation of what the electrons were actually doing within these energy levels. 
Physicists in the field of wave mechanics begin to expand upon these concepts, and the key thing that they come up with is that the electron is not following a definite path. It's following, it's a region in space where we expect to find the electron. So instead of having orbits, we're going to start speaking of orbitals. Orbitals, regions of space where we expect to find the electron. You can define those regions of space by quantum numbers. It's kind of like an address. The most vague quantum number is what's known as the principal quantum number. This just tells us the energy level. So our principal quantum number is our energy level. It could be 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth. To get a little bit more specific, we look at the shape of the orbital. The shape goes with letters. The letters being S, P, D, F. You could go after F, it would go G, H, I, J, K. But we're only going to really deal with S, P, D, and F. Magnetic quantum number gets even more specific. This tells us the orientation in space. Which axes are we on? So if we have our X, Y for two dimensions, and our Z, the dimension coming out of the screen, what of those dimensions are the orbitals located on? The last one here is the spin quantum number. You'll notice there's only two possibilities here. This is plus and minus. So by knowing the energy level, the shape, the orientation in space, and the spin, you can describe the space where we expect to find the electron. I want to look at some of these shapes from the orbital quantum number, and then we'll get into specifics of how we decide exactly where the electron is located. Before we do that, we need to understand that one of the big concerns we have with electrons is that electrons act as both particles and waves at the same time. This is known as the wave-particle duality. Just like photons are packets of energy, can have good properties like particles and waves, electrons can do the same thing. And this is what makes them so difficult for us to really understand everything that's going on. We also have something called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Werner Heisenberg came up with this principle, and it says that we cannot know the position and the velocity of an electron at the same time. So if you know where an electron is located, you have no idea how fast it's moving and what direction. The more precise you know one variable, the less precise you are on the other. So the best we can do in any description of the orbital for an electron is the probability of finding an electron in a certain region of space. In class, we talked about the probability of finding you during a Monday through Friday between 8 and 2, and that probability being the Woodward campus. There's a probability, 95% probability, you'd be located in that region. It doesn't tell specifically where you are, where you're going, where you've been, but it does give us a likelihood to, that you'd be found in, that, found in that region. So That's the best we can do with electrons because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you think of a firefly, it's another example. If we left a firefly in a room and we put something that the firefly was interested, attracted in here in the center, and we left the camera open all night, so it was taking every time the firefly flashed, it made a little dot of light, you would start to see a pattern like this. And what we could say is that I can't tell you at any point in the night where the firefly was located, but I can tell you there's a high probability that the firefly was in this orange area. And that's the best we can say for electrons. So an orbital is thought of as the region around the nucleus where we can expect to find the electron. You can almost think of it as a cloud of negative charge. One of the best explanations, and I know this seems very contrary to our way of understanding the world, is that you can think of the electron being spread out throughout the entire orbital all at the same time. And the quantum numbers give us the shape of that orbital. Now there are two orbitals that we need to know, and we're going to get into the shapes of these orbitals and our electron configurations as we go forward in the course. The key thing to remember, in any energy level, there is a set number of orbitals that the electron may be in, and it's actually the energy level squared. So if you take the first energy level, there is one possible orbital. Second energy level, now we're further away from the nucleus, there's more space, so now we're going to have four possible orbitals. 
The third energy level will give us nine possible orbitals. The fourth energy level will give us 16 possible orbitals, and we could go on like this. The further we get away from the nucleus, the more possible regions of space where we can expect to find the electron. Now we have specific shapes for these orbitals. And the first shape that we will always see in any energy level is S-shaped or spherically shaped. We're going to see a picture of this here. Our spherically shaped elect uh, orbital is just basically a sphere. So if the region around the space is a sphere around the nucleus, first energy level would be a very small sphere very close to the nucleus. The second energy level, the first orbital that gets filled, is also spherically shaped, but now bigger, further away from the nucleus. Third energy level, first orbital is filled, is also S-shaped, even further away from the nucleus, even larger. Fourth energy level, once again, spherically shaped first, but even further away from the nucleus. The other shapes that you need to know are what are known as the P shapes. The next three orbitals in an energy level, so the first energy level only has one orbital, it's S-shaped. Second energy level has an S-shaped orbital. It also has three P-shaped orbitals. The P-shaped orbitals are dumbbell-shaped. You see the three pictures down below. And they're on the three different axes. So this would be the P-X orbital, because it's on the X-axis. This would be the P-Z on the z-axis, and this would be the p-y on the y-axis. A sphere is over all the axes, so we don't have a specific designation for the s-shaped orbital. But for the p-shaped orbitals, we do specifically designate x, y, and z. You need to know the shape of the s-shaped orbitals and the p-shaped orbitals. In the next video, we're going to get into how we decide exactly where the electrons are located, and start to do something known as electron configurations.